Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another Journey on the Fly, the podcast. We're going to continue our discussion regarding the organization that I work with, Cross the Divide. And we're doing at least two interviews. Tonight, a very, very special friend of mine. I'll probably say that about everyone and mean it just the same. Mickey Weikert. Mickey is a military chaplain, and I'll let him give his story. Suffice it to say, he is a man I wish everybody could meet. He has been a tremendous blessing to me, and he's going to discuss not just fly fishing, but his love for the outdoors, his passion for our soldiers, men and women both, and what those two combinations grant him through the organization Cross the Divide and the events that we put on here in Pennsylvania and around the country. So stay tuned. That's coming up in just a couple seconds. Let's get at it. All right, Mr. Mickey. So do us a favor and give us some of your story that, that the, the, the parts that you, you know, take, I don't know, two, three minutes uh, make sure we know your uh, your rank and your time in the military because you're currently enlisted. So uh, let us know a little bit about yourself in that area. All right. Well, um, I'm a Navy chaplain with uh, about 18 years of service now, a little over 18 years of service. Um, Lieutenant commander, that's um, an 04. Um, so kind of the middle middle of the road uh, uh, in, in rank. Um but uh, yeah, so um, prior service Marine, uh, I at 17 years old, uh, I was, you know, seeking God for vocation, and I felt like God, uh, you know, called me to be a Marine. Kind of let down my youth pastor and my pastor um, that uh, saw maybe a, a different uh, vocation for my life. But uh, I felt the peace of God through boot camp and all that kind of thing. And, um, and yeah, so um, shortly after uh, I, I graduated boot camp, married my high school sweetheart, and off to Okinawa, Japan was my first, uh, my first duty station. And, uh, and there I got linked up with the church. And, um, and just uh, being away from home, being away from all that's comfortable. Um, I spent a lot of time in prayer and a lot of time with God and a lot of time in church uh, to the point that uh, that I just couldn't see myself doing anything other than the vocational ministry. Um, and so I uh, got out of the Marine Corps, uh, pastored for a while, then went to seminary. Um, and, uh, and then 9-11 happened in uh, 2005. Um, you know, 60 Minutes and, and all the news outlets were reporting uh, stories about Marines coming back home, broken and busted and hurting. And I just felt uh, kind of a Nehemiah moment of, you know, the walls are broken down in my cities and, and I need to return. And so reached out to our, our chaplain's commission, the endorsing body of our denomination, and shared my story. And, and they said, yeah, we'll support you in this. And, and so... Um, was uh, commissioned in in uh, 2010 and, and been in the Navy ever since. I love it. And thank you, by the way. I know I've said it a hundred times and I'll probably say it another hundred times over the course of our relationship. I I appreciate both your, your original move and your care for our troops and to dive back in there and help them out because I know um, just in general – helping people that are in difficult situations is not an easy task whatsoever. Oh, well, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, it, it's an honor. Um, I was talking to a young Marine today and in the midst of him processing his own stuff, he looks at me and says, you know, you know, why do you do this? You know? And I said, you know, this is sacred. I like, you know, in, in a dark place in your life, you came to me and I get to sit with you in this. And this is, this is holy ground, you know, so I'm just very honored. Man, we could do an entire talk just, just on that statement right there. I don't, I don't think that we 
Um, and I'll pick on us Christians. I, I don't think we Christians take enough time just to listen and realize how important that is for people just to maybe just to get something off their chest, but let alone to really realize when somebody's talking how precious it is to hear them and tell their story. And, and man, that's good stuff. Uh, <laughs> so Mickey, you've, have, have you always been an outdoors type of person as far as like hunting, fishing, things like that? Is that, is that part of your upbringing or something you picked up later in life? Oh, absolutely. A part of my life, um, all my life. Um, you know, I'm from backwards, West Virginia and, um, you know, Friday night football and hunting is pretty much, uh, you know, all you do in, uh, in that area. And so, you know, I grew up, uh, the, uh, the first day of deer season, uh, all the boys had an excused day off. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to <laughs> a time when things maybe weren't, uh, so progressive and, and only boys got the day off, uh, excused if girls got the day, yeah, that was a charged day for them, but but boys were expected to go, uh, to go hunting that day, um, just to bring food, food to the table, you know, in uh, Appalachian, um, poor region like that. Uh, it was just, a, a part of growing up, part of necessity. Um, but yeah, my, my dad was a, a hunter. Uh, we, uh, we hunted squirrel and, and deer and, um, and fish did, we did, we did all that. That's pretty cool. And that that's a forgotten thing too. I think so many of us are caught up in the sport of hunting. We forget like my, my great grandfather who passed at like 96, I think it was. I mean, he'd tell me stories about the depression and eating groundhogs. And, you know, nowadays you hear people talking about groundhogs. They're just going out to see how many they can shoot. Mm -hmm. It was a survival thing for so many people. And it probably still is, to be honest, especially during inflation times like we're in now. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Um, yeah, early in my uh, early days of life, uh, my grandparents, um, I remember eating groundhog. Um, you know, they were uh, just one, one of my sets of grandparents was very poor. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, seeing, seeing this groundhog and them explain it to me and so i tasted it i, I well I, not something i'd want to make a meal out of <laughs> but yeah um desperate times call for desperate measures i guess you know hey, if, but that's but squirrel was a delicacy it, we never stopped uh you know with squirrel which is i think is unique maybe just to the uh the appalachian region a lot of people think i'm weird when i say that uh you know that we hunted in and uh uh and ate squirrel but I don't think so. I mean, I, I remember my brother's um, first wife, she, she would make squirrel pot pie and stuff like that. So it's, it's, mm. it's, it's at least um, within the, the, the relative mountain ranges, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you gave us a little background in your kind of your, 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 your testimony of coming to Jesus and your military background. And the reason I asked the outdoor question is do you see those two when it comes to your service to um, our, our men and women and nurturing and helping and, and all that, do you see that kind of outdoor world and those two um, shake hands? And if so, you know, what are your thoughts on that whole idea of, 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 of bringing those two things together? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, you know, especially with the, the folks that we work with, the, the military folks, there's that that part of them that, you know, I, I really believe there's that just that that spiritual element inside of them that they wanted to serve. They want to, to be a part of something bigger than self. Um, you know, they want to get out and uh, and and maybe uh, be on an adventure. Um, and. Uh, and so just to have that spiritual element of, of being able to, to, to have that with inside them. And then, um, and then just again, going out in the, in the mountains and, and experiencing that adventure, experiencing creation. Um, you know, when I was a pastor, um, first years, I'll be honest with you, the first years of, of 
of pastoring, uh, I left the Marine Corps and essentially went straight into the pastoring. And, and uh, in the Marines, I was running five miles a day and, um, and could eat whatever I wanted and was still at my fighting weight at like 145 pounds or something. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I, I went into pastoring, I was working 90 hours plus a week, uh, eating whatever I wanted, eating at meetings, uh, you know, everything – was revolved around food, you know, the mm-hmm. sisters of the church were bringing food into the pastures, you know, so we were just a lot of eating out of obligation and just being very unhealthy in my lifestyle in those early years of ministry didn't have a, a, a real good, um, a good balance of those things. And I, and so I gained a lot of weight and, um, and I remember, uh, I, I took a trip, I took, a, uh, some of my uh, church members to a, uh, on a mission trip to, uh, Ecuador, and we were up in Quito digging a foundation for a church, and I was overweight, and it was high elevation, and I thought I was going to die. I was like, <laughs> Adam, I am here. I am like thirty years old, maybe even twenties, and you know this is how I'm going to go out. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I learned my lesson, and and I went home and got a mountain bike, and uh, and I just biked the mountains. Um, and I, and the first, first year I lost 30 pounds, second year I lost another 30 pounds. But, but I found that as a discipleship tool that I would bring young uh, men out biking with me. Um, and we would stop at falls. Um, and, uh, you know, we would just, uh, just experience the beauty of God. And it just made uh, talking about God so natural. Uh, it wasn't something I had to come up with. I mean, we were just, we could sense the presence of God uh, in creation, and uh, and I've I've sensed that even to even to today. I think uh, you know I th- I think a lot about how the there, there's a, there's a lot of people and a lot of different worldviews out there, um, and we're we're something that comes to mind because it was literally last night we're using. Um, an Advent book that is put together from some of G.K. Chesterton's writings. And Chesterton, who was, I think, in the early 1900s or something, he was a journalist, an Englishman, and incredibly tactful dude, Um, very, very, very heavy dude. He probably wouldn't be up Mm -hmm. there, you know, in the mountains of Ecuador with you. (laughs) (laughs) Very long anyways before he came down to the stretcher. but. He he said something last night in our readings that's really interesting, and I'll probably get some 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 people iffing about me here on this. But um, he was talking about how oftentimes, especially since we're in the Christmas season, that um, there's this this accusation that in part is somewhat correct that the the the, the Christmas celebration is just a bunch of uh, pagan things adapted and adopted. Um, into the Christian faith and used to celebrate Christmas. And although some of those little elements are true, the fact is that we don't celebrate the pagan. We're redeeming those things and using them to, right. to, to remember. And how this is kind of relating back to is this, this sense that what Chesterton said was that how these pagans, which really just means rural people and in, in their beliefs, um, mm-hmm how these these pagans saw things in create, creation and nature and they responded to them and the christian faith simply says well yeah we expected those to be there that's part of our worldview from the very beginning yeah. and it it that it's it's reminding me of that that when you take people out into nature and creation there is this sense of wonder and splendor and 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 just it moves people and everybody, I mean, I don't know anybody unless they have an honest to God, um, uh, maybe mental issue. And, and, and I'm not m- knocking that. I'm saying there are people that just can't respond to things like that. And, and that's the sense that I'm kind of getting from what you're explaining is that not only does the believer see that, but everybody recognizes there's something about being out there. Um, so in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, go ahead. Have you had anything to say? I, I was just saying the, you know, the Apostle Paul said the exact same thing in Romans, right? That that yeah. that uh, creation declares the glory of God, um, and uh, yeah, it leaves no question that that God is real. Um, as you as you just observe nature, um, it, it declares that God is good. 
So with that, we have uh, you and I met each other through Across the Divide event and um, mm-hmm. in another podcast that I put out earlier this week. I kind of explained in brief what Across the Divide itself is. From your experience, would you say, would you agree with the statement that Cross the Divide takes what you experienced with um, the men and women in military and the outdoors and brings that all together in a program or events and things like that? Absolutely. I mean, um, I have found no better way uh, to connect um, to, to connect military members to the divine um, in such a unique and creative and impactful way uh, as Cross the Divide does. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a chaplain for uh, for a number of years, and uh, you know, to be able to take my Marines and sailors um, out to these events with with Cross the Divide. Um, and for them to experience nature, to experience, to getting getting away from, um, you know, from the video games and the the peer pressure of their um, uh, of their peers and uh, and of the work, uh, the workload, and uh, and to just focus in on God and and, and in the midst of God's beauty, um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, just those uh, those divine connections are made. Um, you know, people open up in a, uh, and become vulnerable, um, and, and just very unique ways that, that I can't match. I can't, uh, I can't match it. So I know because of some of your, your, your history of growing up in the outdoors and, and all that. And, and I know that you're not the case that takes any of that for granted with, with, with any of the events or your workings with, within um, cross the divide and some of the things that, that we've done together and even maybe some things you've done um, uh, outside of our particular get togethers. What has you personally uh, experienced or been impacted as a person that, 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 that serves in the military and serves our military, which is, which is an interesting way to think about that um, mm-hmm. yourself. Oh, well, I mean, I'm, you know, especially with those events i mean to just to have the opportunity to to get away uh to be on the water um you know that's that's the unique thing about fly fishing is you're literally wading in creation um you know uh, with uh with god's beauty all around you and uh my experience is if if i'm fish if i'm fly fishing i'm there i can't be anywhere else um, and it's just that immersive moment um, that uh, um, that pulls me away from from the burdens of the world, pulls me away from um, the distractions, and uh, and really helps me to uh, to be grounded and, and to be grounded with uh, a divine experience. Man, I love that. That that can't be said any better. <clears throat> Man, what? So, so there's so much there. So. Um, I know, and and I'm just going to assert it because it's the way God intended us to catch fish, that fly fishing is the best way to catch fish. So (laughs) absolutely. Um, (laughs) what are your thoughts on that? Because at at the end of the day, you know, this podcast is about life and fly fishing and I, and I, Mm -hmm. and I make it that way on purpose because life, life is different to a lot of people. Um, but we all have some things that are very much in common. We kind of alluded to that, uh, in, in, in our like the effects that the creation has upon all of us. Um, but what, what is, what is fly fishing to you? Kind of give me a little bit of your headspace on that. And what, what does it mean to you and, and, and pursuing those, those different types of fish and whatever? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm one of those that, that grew up in the early nineties, uh, you know, when, uh, when Robert Redford did that film um, uh, from the Norman Clay book, I, you know, I remember runs through it. Uh, I was sucked into the romance of that, uh, as was, as was my wife, you know, and so it was something that we just kind of we we were sucked into the romance of that movie, um, and uh, and so you know, I I, I was a, a spinner rod fisherman, you know, if I fished before that movie came out, and I remember, you know, running out and, and buying, buying a, fr- a fly rod and and uh, and trying to immerse myself into that world. 
Um, and and ever since, it's it's just been um, a, a desire, a strong desire for me to uh, to to learn all that I can about the about the sport. Um, you know, it is uh, it is more romantic, I think. Um, you know, and and we've traveled, uh, you know, to New York, to to Vermont, to Montana, um, to to track down these, uh, you know, to track down these trout. And uh, it is, it's the, and for me, it's the romance of it. Um, it's uh, um, it it takes every part. You know, obviously, you've you've seen me fish. If, if you're looking for a fly fisherman, a uh, fly fishing expert, I'm, I'm not invited into this podcast, right? We'll just kind of lay that out there. Um, but uh, but it takes every part of you. There is, I don't I don't know that you can plunge the depth of uh, of fly fishing, um, and uh, and I certainly have it. Um, but there's so much to learn. There's um, you know in technique and uh, and in and bugs and and uh and so i just i just love it um and uh you know it's it keeps you busy it keeps you moving um and thinking so it's a different type of angling it it absolutely is and and i i like the fact that you said that you know when you're fly fishing you're kind of you're you're just there and that's it like like for one of the things that i tried not just to promote with with uh, my events and, and connections across the divide, which it's it's honestly with every single guy client, is the fact that when you're casting, when you're focused, when you're even tying a knot, all those things take so much focus that yeah. nothing else. It doesn't matter how bad your world is outside of fly fishing. This is the moment that you get to be knee deep in creation, completely connected in in every single way you can be every sense every fiber of you is immersed in all of that and just just kind of let it happen and take take that all in and even if you got to go back to crazy you at least have that memory to bring back with you in hopes that you're going to create more but yeah. also to sustain you a little bit that you know you can sit down when things are going wild and and remember that time out there. Maybe it was, I remember it was about two months ago. I had two clients out and um, I happened to, I forget exactly what we're doing. We were in the stream and I said, Oh, look at that. And there goes an adult bald Eagle. And it wasn't mm -hmm. two seconds later. And a second one came through and it was hilarious. We, we, we just, I mean, they were in awe. Matter of fact, if I remember correctly, the gentleman and his wife, both, I think said that that was the first time they ever seen a bald eagle wow yeah which is crazy because you know that yeah. was 50 years ago nobody saw them and now they're like right right they're, they're almost overpopulated especially where yeah. i live they're everywhere out yeah. here. it's pretty crazy but um so it's just there's so much to that and i think you've made a, a very strong case here on not just your own experience with the outdoors and with ministry and connecting people to it are there any and and obviously um, we're not asking for names and, and, and specific lives here, but, um, right. are there anything that you could tell us from some of the men and women that you've participated in these events with that some of the things that may, they may have said or taken back with them that, that would inspire people to maybe get involved somehow in, in, in you know, boots on the ground, or maybe honestly, uh, open their wallet to help us do more of these events. Yeah, I mean, I think just in general terms, you know, I I was uh, honored to be able to uh, bring some members of my command uh, on this last uh, event that that we hosted together, and uh, you know, you said you know, you get away from crazy, uh, be in the moment, and then and then go back and maybe have to go back to crazy, but but you go back to crazy more equipped, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, uh, after the event. Just, uh, I mean, just weeks of just, you could tell the ones that were on the trip and the ones that weren't. I mean, there was a glow. There was a connectedness um, that uh, that was different. I mean, I think that, that you know, the other the other Marines and sailors that, that saw the ones that came back, and there was a, maybe a little bit of envy of like, wow, 
You know, these people are more connected. They're more grounded. They, they have a smile on their face that they didn't have before. Um, you know, they, they had a, they knew they had a resource, uh, to, to draw upon. Um, yeah, just to, to to see the strength that they had coming back into again, uh, you know, our uh, our command specifically uh, uh, deals with a lot of the political things, and uh, and we're in the middle of a, a, a big uh, you know election year seri- uh, election year, and and so we've been very busy, uh, but nevertheless, you know, um, our folks were just you know very strengthened and encouraged uh, coming back from it, uh, but more specifically, uh, you know, I, I had one. Uh, gentleman that uh, um, has, has struggled pretty hard. I've spent a lot of time with him in my office, and uh, and for him to just be able to go out, be in creation, um, to step away. I mean, maybe not even the fish, the fishing as much, but just to be able to step away um, and to and to voice his prayers. You know, he's a barracks dweller. Um, he, you know, it, he feels weird to be able to voice his prayers. Uh, you know, among his, uh, you know, his roommates and, and and those that live in the barracks and, and around him, he's never alone. He never gets an opportunity to just be alone with with God. And and uh, and he he, you know, kind of testified to me that that he felt such strength uh, just to be able to go out and to voice his prayers uh, in nature uh, to God. Um, yeah, it was uh, it's amazing. <laughs> that is. That's good stuff. I, I want to ask you kind of two more questions. One of them is, and it's not really controversial. I guess it could be. So your group that we take out, that, that we took out, the, the, the folks that were in your command, um, sometimes when organizations are trying to do things for veterans, um, the thought immediately goes to, that veteran that has been um, ha- has seen the worst of the worst and is dealing with a lot of PTSD and 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 just he's he's that person's been through hell and back and those people are absolutely vital and those are one of the focuses of cross the divide. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say to somebody that may take a little issue with folks that haven't seen? wartime, but are still in the mix serving this country in different capacities to take them out? Why, why are they just as important um, to, as, as, the, as the other people that we kind of traditionally see helping in yeah. these types of organizations? Yeah. Well, well, well I'll say that uh, most of those raised their right hand when we were in combat. Or grew up most of their life uh, experiencing a wartime America, and uh, and nevertheless they raised the right hand and said, "I want to serve my country, uh, and I'm willing to go there." Um, and and they did. They raised their right hand. They were willing to go, and now they're apart from their family. Um, they're uh, they're living. A lot of them are living inside the barracks. I mean, their whole life is devoted to the service of our country, apart from their resources, apart from their local churches, apart from um, their, uh, you know, support systems back home uh, and friends. They've devoted their life to our country, um, and they and they stand ready. Uh, they train hard, and they're prepared um, for that day when, uh, when the nation calls upon them. They're you know they're they're here doing it, and so they they deserve our our love and our respect. Um, you know, they missed it, and and praise God for them for for that. Um, and uh, and and you know, my desire is that uh, that they in they they can retire in in the in the Marines or in the Navy, and never have to face that uh, a wartime scenario, uh, scenario, but they stand ready. Yeah. You know? Amen. Man, I, I really appreciate that. That puts it all into perspective. I don't think anybody could say anything uh, in opposition to that. And it's really, 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 really important. As as I was reminded many times um, that every Marine is a rifleman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, prepared and, and ready for those things. And I agree with you 100%. I hope that uh, 
no one that raises that right hand ever has to face those things. And, uh, but I appreciate the people that have, and it's the sacrifices that they still make, uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of, um, because sometimes we just, we, we think in extremes too much, um, in general as, as people. And I know, Mm -hmm. I know I do too often ask, ask my wife. (laughs) (laughs) So one last final question. Um, if you had an opportunity, which you actually do right here, to talk to some people out there and about getting involved with Cross the Divide that you had to, and, and I hate to say it this way, but because I, I'm not much of a salesman, but if you had to pitch it, what would you say from Mickey's world? Yeah. Um, you know, I would say that, that I, I wish they could experience the, the change. Um, I wish that they, they could experience um, the looks on, on people's faces when they when they catch a fish, when they just get out in nature, maybe for the very first time, uh, and they learn uh, something new about themselves. And, and along the way, uh, they're tying their story with God's story and finding meaning and purpose and hope for their life. Um, there's nothing like it in the world. I love it. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Mickey. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me on. Of course, of course. Fly fishing is solitary, contemplative, misanthropic, scientific in some hands, poetic in others, and laced with conflicting aesthetic considerations. It's not even clear if catching fish is actually the point. I don't know who said that, but it sums up in so many ways what we do with Cross the Divide and fly fishing. And I'm honored and blessed to have lived my entire life except for a year or two here and there in the beautiful state of Pennsylvania with some of the best trout streams arguably in the world but definitely east of the Mississippi. Help us. Help our veterans, our men and women who are serving this country who, as Mickey said, raised their right hand and committed to whatever comes. Mickey, again, love you, brother. So blessed to have you as a friend. You've heard it from his mouth. This is good stuff. This is Adam signing off from Journey on the Fly. Just as a reminder, you can find us on iHeart, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on our website at journeyonthefly.fish. I think we're still on Google Play. I'm not sure if that's even a thing. There was some stuff changing there. We ask you one more thing. If you enjoy this podcast, leave a review wherever you're at, wherever you're listening to it. So important. Here's why. The more reviews we get, the more traffic and the more people that will hear this. It's something easy. It's going to take you a minute. Thank you for your time. And remember, it's not about the destination. It's the journey that makes us. Till the next time, God bless.